When it comes to superheroes, the devil is in the details. There are about a bajillion things that can go wrong when designing a comic book character, and it shouldn't really come as a surprise to discover that even some of the most beloved characters didn't come out guns blazing right out of the gate. Heck, if Bob Kane had had his way, Batman would have been rocking red long johns and a mechanical pair of wings when he debuted in Detective Comics number 27. Sometimes changing just one or two details, no matter how subtle, is all it takes to take a character to the next level, or just save them from certain doom. As always, I'm Ewan from What Culture Comics, and here are 10 subtle changes that saved iconic comic book characters. Number 10. Discovering Philosophy – The Question Steve Ditko, as revolutionary as he was throughout the Silver Age, was prone to the occasional lapse. For every Spider-Man, you had a Mr. A. For every Mr. A, you had The Question, who was basically Mr. A, but less angry. The main problem with Ditko's original Question series was the same problem that cropped up in certain issues of Spider-Man and even Blue Beetle, that being that Ditko was a sucker for Randian objectivist philosophy. And if you've ever read a single single sentence by Rand, you'll know why it's almost impossible to get through an issue of that original run without your eyes rolling out of your skull. The solution to this was as simple as DC just waiting for Charlton Comics to collapse and swoop up its characters 20 years later. So when the question came to DC Comics post-crisis, the reins were handed to writer Dennis O'Neill, an absolute legend of the medium who sadly passed away earlier this year. Overnight, O'Neill, together with Dennis Cohen, metaphysically killed off the original Vic Sage and started anew. And thus, the question became more of a philosophical figure instead of just a paragon of objectivist philosophy. Also, we have a video all about Dennis O'Neill and Dennis Cohen's question, so go check that out if you haven't already. Number 9. Superman's Declining Powers Post-Crisis Superman There were many reasons given for rebooting the entire DC Universe the first time in Crisis on Infinite Earths. From more general goals like streamlining the DC Universe as a whole by doing away with the DC Multiverse altogether, to much more character-specific decisions such as the many alterations made to Superman's comics. Superman being akin to Santa Claus for a lot of kids, a mythic figure who can just do any thing that you want him to, the Man of Steel had spent years with that mindset being applied to his power set, with him often just making up new powers on the spot because he's Superman. Over time, this approach, as well as the seemingly unending array of super characters that the publishers beck and call, undermined Superman's importance and relatability, and was in part why Crisis came about in the first place. With the reboot, DC just cut everything but his base power set, heat vision, super strength, indestructibility, ice breath, and flight, and reset his mythology to zero to start again. Although certain elements have returned, there's no denying it was an essential change to make to a hero then rapidly losing appeal. Number 8. Introducing the Parallax Fear Anomaly – Green Lantern When Green Lantern was rebooted in the Silver Age, DC changed the power ring from having a mystical source to a sci-fi one, being a cosmic embodiment of willpower that just also happened to be weak to the colour yellow. Wait, what? Yeah, for decades, Green Lantern was infamous among comics readers for having one of the all-time dumbest weaknesses in the history of the medium. Now, in most cases like this, the solution, if you want your character to be taken seriously as time goes on, would be to just pretend it was never a thing to begin with, because they're comics, and it is totally okay to do just that. Instead, DC went with a different solution. See, when they introduced the color spectrum of power rings, they also introduced various deities that represented those types of rings, most notably Parallax, and with him came the minor lore detail known as the Parallax Fear Anomaly. This is the Green Lantern mythos's small but effective way of explaining why their power rings don't work on things that are yellow. They can, under normal circumstances, unless the ring bearer is incredibly afraid. When that happens, the rings have no effect. Number 7. The Circular Shield – Captain America 
The original Captain America shield, as the movie so helpfully showed, was originally, well, a shield. It was angular, sort of diamond-shaped, good for blocking bullets, but not a lot else. While Captain America wasn't necessarily in danger of being cancelled, especially after that first issue sold so well, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby quickly realised that the Captain needed something a bit more creative in their arsenal for the sake of excitement, if nothing else. So they redesigned the shield to be a perfectly circular, disc shape, as well as simplified the colour scheme to instead be comprised of two red stripes, two white stripes, and a blue centre with a big old white star slap bang in the middle. This not only made it more easily recognisable, but its disc shape meant that Cap could now throw his shield to take down enemies, making for more creative and dynamic fight scenes. Number 6. Leaning more into the crazy, Deadpool The best thing that ever happened to Deadpool was Rob Liefeld being kicked off of riding him. Sure, that goes for a lot of different comic book characters, but once that happened, the Deadpool we all know and love began to surface. It's difficult to pinpoint a precise moment where this change happened, if anything it was more of a slow, dawning realisation on the part of the people riding him throughout the late 90s and early 2000s that a character who can come back from literally anything can be a great vehicle for comedy. It is worth noting, however, However, that the first occasion where Deadpool broke the fourth wall came in Joe Kelly's run on the character in Deadpool number 28. Thus, the Merc with a Mouth went from yet another Rob Liefeld creation, obviously ripping off Deathstroke, to the dark, biting satire of superhero comics that everyone loves today. What makes watching the change in real time throughout Deadpool's early appearances really is how subtle it surprisingly is. Basically, nothing about his backstory and personality change. He was already pretty casual about his inability to die and the harm he causes others. It's just that the universe around him started treating what was going on as funny instead of with the typical edginess that defined comics in the 1990s. Number 5. Joined the X-Men Wolverine Wolverine originally debuted in an issue of The Hulk as a one-off opponent for the Jade Giant to face. After the issue ended, we didn't hear much out of Wolverine, and why would we? He was a bad guy of the month, and once The Hulk was done with him, he'd served his purpose. But then came along Len Wein and Dave Cockrum. With the X-Men having laid dormant for several years, Wein and Cockrum decided to reboot the entire team with new and old characters, one of which was was Wolverine, who was co-created by Wine in the aforementioned Hulk comic. Wolverine's base personality went unchanged, but when he was put on a team with characters like Cyclops, Storm, Kitty Pride, and Jean Grey, Logan's personality and backstory began to flourish. The results of this speak for themselves, as Wolverine is now one of the most famous characters in the entire Marvel canon. Where would he be today without the X-Men? Number 4. Forming the Heroes for Hire Luke Cage and Iron Fist These days, the Marvel Netflix shows have done more than enough to make people love Luke Cage. The less said about what they did to Iron Fist, though, the better. And Iron Fist has been kicking around since the 70s. But there was a time where these two heroes were about to be scrapped for good. Iron Fist and Luke Cage were both products of the martial arts and black exploitation film movements of the 1970s. So when martial arts movies and black exploitation cinema started to die out, Marvel, Frank had no idea what to do with either character. The solution was devious in its simplicity. Team the pair of them up. Very little about the two as characters changed, but putting them together in one book turned their look around practically overnight. The two characters are alright on their own, but together their chemistry is electrifying. This one simple change made these two almost forgotten minor heroes into legends of the Marvel Universe. Number 3. Ditch the Batman Comparisons – Green Arrow People joke about Green Arrow being a knockoff of Batman all the time, and for good reason. That's exactly what he was when he first started out. Well, thankfully, when Green Arrow was folded into the larger DC universe, they found the perfect spin on the character to separate him from Bruce, have him lose his fortune, and become a hard-travelling lefty in the late 1960s. Oh, and he also grew a really cool Van Dyke beard, which is a pretty important detail too. The change came courtesy of Dennis O'Neill yet again, only this time with Neil Adams on the Green Lantern Green Arrow comic, which cast Queen opposite Hal Jordan, a space cop who embodied establishment conservative politics. It gave Ollie an identity that was all his own, to the point where the biggest gripe people had with the Arrow TV show when it first started out was how it seemed obsessed with being everything that had been holding Green Arrow back to begin with, a ripoff of Batman. Number 2. Admitted that she had a point 
Poison Ivy. Ever since her inception, Poison Ivy was intended to be a superpowered commentary on eco-terrorism, someone who took her love for the environment quote-unquote too far by escalating it to violence against innocent people or, shock horror, the poor guiltless oil barons and forest-destroying corporations. Yeah, if they didn't make some kind of pivot with her fast, Ivy would not have lasted long into the 2000s. Now that we are mere decades from irreversible ecological disaster, more and more comics writers have made waves to reform Ivy. She's now more of an anti-hero than a straight-up bad guy. Her motivations are still the same, but the universe doesn't immediately vilify her as much as it used to, like the infamous Batman animated series episode where she's somehow the bad guy for turning a woman who ordered the deforestation of a millennia-old rainforest for cardboard into a tree. While she does still occasionally walk in circles with the villains, Poison Ivy's first and foremost priority has been shifted to the protection of the planet, something that's come as a relief to readers, and fans of Ivy especially. And number one, introducing the red costume, Daredevil. More than any other entry on this list, this little change was something that Daredevil desperately needed if he was going to survive in the modern day. The yellow costume that he debuted in definitely has its charms, but it was an odd choice for a character who lifted his namesake from Satan himself. Leave it to artist Wally Wood to respond, who gave the man without fear his now iconic crimson costume in 1965's Daredevil number 7. The new suit is his now famous solid red skin type bodysuit with two D's emblazoned on the chest, and two little red horns on the head. It gave Matt Murdock a more imposing image while still being bright and colourful, and while the occasional change has been made here or there, Wood's template isn't going away anytime soon. And that was our list. Know of any other examples where subtle changes saved the character? Let us know down in the comments below, and don't forget to please support the channel by liking the video and subscribing for more so you don't miss another upload going forward. That's all for now though, keep reading comics, keep supporting your local comic book store while you're at it, and I will see you soon. Bye!